So find and interpret systematic reviews. Actually, it's a question of you finding the systematic reviews, appraising systematic reviews, and then interpreting them. There are obviously three steps in this process, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these individual steps. And the first question that you might ask, which is probably an appropriate one for this point in the history of evidence-based medicine, is, is this question. Is it actually that easy to find systematic reviews? Well, this is a picture, and I just, even without the, sh the shudder, I don't imagine you can see it all. I don't want you to see the, particularly see the numbers, but this actually shows the number of systematic reviews that are indexed in PubMed from 1947 uh, onwards. And these are the key things to look at. There were six systematic reviews in 1947. There are 86,107 uh, each in 2011. So you can see there's been this huge growth in the production of systematic reviews. If you actually go to Google Scholar and search for the term systematic review, you get two and a half million hits and over a million of those in the last uh, 10 years. So the question, one of the questions you might ask is why? And it would be nice to think that there are some very noble reasons for the number of systematic reviews that people have recognized that they are key building blocks for evidence. But sadly, that's not necessarily the case. I know from talking to journal editors that journal editors like systematic reviews. Why do journal editors like systematic reviews? Does anyone know the answer? Because they get cited and they improve the impact factor of the journal. So many journals are very keen to publish things which they can label systematic um, reviews. Which then comes on to the next question. When is a systematic review not a systematic review? I think that we need to make sure that there's always a health warning attached to something that calls itself a systematic review. I'm going to go on and talk about the features of a good systematic review so, so those of you that don't know already will know what to look for and what the, the markers of a good systematic review are. But it's very easy for journal editors to ask their authors to write systematic reviews and for people to go out and do reviews in a very unsystematic re way, but stick those words in the title and everybody seems to be happy. So a definite health warning, a systematic review in name is not necessarily a systematic review in substance. So we come back to this question, is it in reality that easy to find systematic reviews? Well, it's actually the wrong question, isn't it? Because the question that you really want is you want to try and find high quality uh, systematic reviews. And how do we go about doing that? Well, one way of doing it, and we've sort of begun this process already, is in the same way as if you were buying uh, something for your, for your home. You can look for trusted brands. And I'm going to come back to this, this theme of trust uh, as we go through the talk. So trusted brands, the YouGov brand index poll for 2012 showed that there were three uh, trusted, the three, the three brands I'm going to show you next were in their top 10. Amazon was number three, Marks and Spencers was number, number four, and John Lewis was number two. So there we are, three good trusted brands. If you were going to buy goods as a British consumer, you might choose to go to one of these brands. And let's stick with this one. Let's imagine you were thinking you were going to buy some pajamas. Where would you go? You'd go to Marks and Spencers, wouldn't you? And you'd get something like this. Now, the great thing about these pajamas is there's nothing, they're not fancy, but they're of high quality and they cover everything appropriately. Okay, so this is the perfect, okay. Now, as in contrast with these, the quality here is of extremely dubious taste, but at least there's adequate coverage. And just so you know, I don't intend to show you properly l low coverage, low quality, because that would, be, uh, uh, t would be clearly be inappropriate. But what you're looking for here is something, a trusted brand, which will mean you can be confident. And I would say this, wouldn't I? And I should have really begun this talk, should I not, with my conflict statement. But one of the trusted brands is the Cochrane Library. 
and uh, you know you can go here and find high-quality systematic reviews. But at the same time, we've, we've heard this morning already about HTA reviews, and lots of other organizations are producing nowadays high-quality systematic reviews. And so one of the things you need to understand is be aware which those organizations are. NICE is another example of a UK body, the WHO, there are American associations as well. So an understanding of the trusted brands is one way of finding good quality systematic reviews. But then the next option is if you, if you find reviews or either reviews that you're not certain about, can you get a good quality opinion on another, somebody else's systematic review? So what about trusted opinions? People who you can trust to have looked at systematic reviews and have made some comment on it. Now, as you know, there are various things we can do here. We could go to the media. Here's an example of a publisher who you may not quite believe. Or you could go to politicians. Uh, whether you believe these people or not might depend on your particular point of view. But of course, not all publishers are bad publishers. You could go to a high quality publishing house like the BMJ, and not all politicians are necessarily bad politicians. Here's the Nobel Prize winner and recent Oxford University a laureate. So in terms of the quality of opinion, I've got three pictures again here, the sorts of things that you might look for. These again are from the YouGov poll, Money, Super, Money Expert, Google, and Which. And if there's equivalent of these, this is my advert for Leslie, my colleague in the front row here. This is the Center for Reviews and Dissemination in York, which is the sister organization of the UK Cochrane Center, and we're part of the NIHR-funded systematic reviews program. And one of the products that appears from the Center for Reviews and Dissemination is the DARE database, the database of abstracts of reviews of effects. And so you can go here to find a database which contains systematic reviews in it. And in order to get into the DARE database, you need to have fulfilled all of these third top three criteria here. So the systematic review has to have inclusion criteria reported, an adequate search, and the included studies have to be synthesized, and you need one of the other criteria as well. So four, you need at least four criteria of which one to three are mandatory. And the advantage of going to this source to look for your systematic review is that you actually get a commentary. The staff at the Center of Views and Dissemination have looked at the review and comment on it. So for example, here's one on aspirin and cancer risk, a quantitative review to 2011. Here is the summary of the review based on the, the abstract that the authors wrote. But the most, and here at the bottom is the URL to the paper, but the useful thing is this part in the middle here. The, Leslie staff at the Center for Views and Dissemination have looked at this review and provide some critical uh, comments about it. So that's one option. There are other trusted sources, as, as uh, trusted opinions as well, but if you want a shortcut to going somewhere where people have looked at the systematic reviews and commented on them, that's one. But the, but the final, the third thing I want to say about trust is trust yourself with a trusted technique. So, those people here who are not familiar with reading and interpreting systematic reviews might want to get the skills that are required for that. And here's just one example. The Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, who are hosting this meeting, will provide training. But I would guide you as well towards this resource. The Critical Appraisal Skills Program was one of those many things that Muir Gray was responsible for setting up many years ago. And it's still very much uh, in, in existence. And the CASP program is going, we, we have a relationship between the United Kingdom Cochrane Center and the CASP program where we're hoping to partner with each other to promote these, the tools that they produce uh, as we go forward. But as you'll see, they have a number of things. They have workshops, they have a network, but they also have checklists which allow you to appraise a randomized trial, an economic evaluation, or particularly in this case, a systematic review. You can go and download these for free. And so here's the front page of the CASP program's systematic review appraisal sheet. And those of you that are familiar with the tools of evidence-based medicine will be familiar with these three questions, which we'll just go through uh, very briefly here. But they're the standard EBM interpretation uh, questions. Questions that look, first of all, at the validity of the results. 
asking the questions, does the review address a clearly focused question? I'm going to come back to this issue of focus question a little bit uh, later on. It guides you through the process of looking at the way the authors of the review have searched for and identified the right sort of papers to include in the review. And it asks the question whether you think that all the important relevant studies were included in the systematic review. And again, in a moment, we'll come back to this issue of relevance. Did the authors do enough to assess the quality of the included studies? And if the results have been combined, was it reasonable to do, do so? A series of questions that go to the heart of, of this question, are the results of the review valid? Has the review been conducted in such a way that you can actually believe the results? And then the second question, what are the results? Often in terms of a particular measure of an effect size, for, exa effect, for example. And the second part of that question about what are the results is how certain can you be about the results, which is determined by, for example, the confidence interval around that test result. And then another important question, which again is relevant when we're talking about the inclusion of systematic reviews in guidelines. Will the results help me locally? Will this particular result of this systematic review help me looking after my patients? Or in the case of guideline writers, in the guideline that you're trying to produce, is this systematic review uh, going to be helpful? So finding the systematic reviews, appraising the systematic reviews, and interpreting them. And the points I want to make are think about trying to find a trusted brand for the systematic review in the first place, or take trusted advice in terms of appraisal of those reviews, or use a tried and tested and trusted technique when it comes to actually interpreting the review yourself. But before I finish, let's just talk a little bit about this issue of interpretation, because we were asked at the beginning of this meeting to try and be a bit controversial uh, and pose some questions and, and be very reflective. There are some important issues here and important controversies. And these, to my mind, are some of the controversies about the use of systematic reviews and in general, but in particular when we're looking at guidelines. Do systematic reviews always ask the right questions? Uh, I would say this about Cochrane reviews. I'd say this about anyone, anyone's reviews. It's very easy to ask the wrong, the wrong question. Um, and it, it's, it can be very difficult to answer the right question. Systematic reviews using the wrong outcomes. When people are doing guidelines, they're very focused on outcomes that matter to the users of the guidelines, be they patients, health workers, commissioners or policymakers. That's not necessarily the case when people are doing systematic reviews. So it's critical that as we do, all of us that are involved with doing systematic reviews, make sure that we're using the right outcomes. And systematic reviews are looking at the wrong uh, study types. As you know, there's been a strong focus on systematic reviews of randomized trials for a whole range of reasons to do with the methodological purity of that, of that, of that process. But as many have pointed out, we probably need to, if we're looking for best evidence, we need to look beyond the randomized trials. This is where the Voltaire quote comes in, or attributed to Voltaire, perfection is the enemy of good. Um, sometimes I think we can focus very particularly on certain study types to produce a perfect systematic review without it necessarily then being able to answer an important uh, clinical question. So as we go forward, we need to address these particular controversies. So, the question actually probably should be, is it easy to find a high quality, relevant, comprehensive systematic review? Not always, has to be the honest answer, but I hope all of us that are involved in producing systematic reviews, be it the HTA, NICE, Cochrane, whatever, will be looking increasingly to make sure that not only is the quality high, but the reviews are relevant and comprehensive. And I leave you with uh, this slide, with the Cochrane logo, the Cochrane Library, and to also to say thank you to our funders. The, much of the Cochrane endeavor in the UK is funded by the National Institute for Health Research, and we're very grateful for that. Thank you. <laughs>